A very warm welcome. You're looking at the edition of Country Life that came out in May 2015, uh, caused a great brouhaha amongst uh, lovers of Shakespeare. Shakespeare, his true likeness, revealed at last the greatest discovery in 400 years, how one man cracked the Tudor Code. Uh, that man was a brilliant scholar, a historian, botanist, historian of botany, called Mark Griffiths, and what he was doing was studying John Gerard. John Gerard was the chief gardener to Lord Burley, um, William Sissel, and to other members of the aristocracy at the time. He also describes himself here, as you can see, as on this book, a master in chirurgery. He was obviously very connected to medicine and the effect of various herbs, medicinal effect of various herbs. Um, now, what did John? Uh, what I'm sorry. What did what did Mark do? Mark Griffiths. He examined this title page very, very carefully indeed. And the first thing he did is to ask himself who were these five characters depicted on the title page. Uh, I can't actually re recall whether he identified this as Venus. I think she's Venus. The alternatives would be Ceres, Pomona, uh, or Flora. But I think she's Venus. Venus was the uh, anciently the goddess of gardens and fields to the Romans. Um, she's more often associated now as the goddess of love, but she does appear on contemporary books of botany in that sort of position. So anyway, whether she's Venus or not, it doesn't have much effect on the argument that I'm unravelling to you. Um, this was identified by Mark Griffiths as Adam. Adam, of course, not only the first person, but the person who named all of creation uh, and also the first gardener. And the Lord put Adam into the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it, Genesis 2.15. So again, he is uh, very often depicted um, on books of botany and herbs. Opposite him, another regular on such pages, Dioscorides. He was really the second great writer on botany and herbs, a great namer and classifier of plants. Um, and he was... An ancient joined the Roman army, it is said, and wrote five books, and very important books in the history of um, botany. The third person there is, of course, the third king of Israel, King Solomon, uh, again associated with plants and flowers. Actually, if you turn the page of this book just to the dedication, where John Gerard writes his dedication to Lord Burley, uh, he writes of Solomon, whose wisdom and knowledge were such that he was able to set out the nature of all plants from the highest cedar to the lowest moss. And the fourth character there, um, very obviously Apollo. Um, one thing that that Mark Griffiths did was to research lots of other botany books in their front covers and, and notice that these people are all very regularly associated and depicted on their title pages. Uh, with Apollo, he cites books by Brunfels, Dodoens, Clusius, Light, Lobel, Durante, and Tabernay Montanus, uh, all of the 16th century, all books on herbs and botany, all depicting Apollo. So they're all regulars. At this point, I suppose he hasn't done anything hugely special. He's, as I say, examined other books. He has one, um, a, a, a posthumous edition of Rembert Dodoens. Um, from 1616, and there you can see Adam on the title page, what I think is a prelapse here in Adam. It, I, well, is he is he ashamed of his genitals? That's the question there, if it's pre or post. Um, are they just growing naturally, or is he hiding them? If he's hiding them, it's post. This is uh, King Solomon again. He appeared on the Gerard book. So did Dioscorides. Theophrastus didn't, but he's the... Uh, the one who preceded Dioscorides as perhaps the first great writer on these, on this subject. Here's an earlier book from 1532. Again, you see Dioscorides on the left, and opposite him is Apollo. Apollo, god of sun. You can see that radiating behind him um, of music, great patron of music in the Arrows Archery. And up in the top where we saw what we thought was Venus on the Gerard, you get Venus again on this one. Um, Anyway, you're getting the point. This is the Kreuter book of 1586, and there you have Dioscorides uh, opposite the post-Lapsarian Adam. So um, you can see uh, there's Adam and Dioscorides opposite each other there, and you can see how Mark Griffiths worked out who these people 
were and it wasn't too difficult. But what he did was find something much more interesting. He looked at these figures and I think one thing he must have asked himself is how come they're not holding the plants that one normally would associate with them? For instance, there's Dioscorides, who you would normally associate with the tulip. You saw, in fact, holding a tulip in the previous image I showed you. Uh, he's not holding a tulip. Apollo, of course, we associate with the hyacinth, and there's no hyacinth in either of his hands down there. So this raises a question, and it was through asking this question that he realised something interesting. Take this Adam. I'm going to blow him up a bit. Now, what Mark Griffiths realised was actually this fellow is dressed as Adam, but actually he is a contemporary who, like Adam, is a gardener, hence he's holding a spade. And like Adam, he's someone who named creation. In fact, in this particular example, he named that flower and he called it a pask flower. And what he did was, uh, reading previous books, he noticed that the pask flower had been classified along with those two flowers you can see uh, on either side of his hips down there. But this clever man realised that the past flower should be differently classified and renamed it. Hence, you can see him holding it up on his shoulder away from the other two flowers. And he called it the Pask flower, which means the Easter flower. Easter, of course, is a time of resurrection, and this man had just recovered from a near-fatal illness. This man, of course, is the author himself, John Gerard. It was he who named that flower, the Pask flower. And if you look at their faces, you can see that it is one is clearly a, a portrait of, of, of the other. Well, they're both portraits, I'm sorry, of Gerard, but they, you can see by the comparison they're very similar. Uh, both have long, thin faces, long noses and thin jaw lines and rather surprised eyes. Uh, talking of the eyes, of course, you look at um, the portrait of Gerard dressed as Adam, on, on the botany book, and you see that he's looking straight at us. He's looking at the reader. That's another clue. He is addressing the reader. He is therefore the author. Like like Adam, he is the originator, but here he's the author, and he addresses the reader just as he does in the rest of the book by writing directly to them or for them. There's another little clue, actually, that Mark Griffiths didn't spot. If you look at uh, the, the Dioscorides figure uh, to the right there, you'll see that he's facing... Um, Gerard and he's pointing with the index finger of his left hand he's pointing to Gerard's coat of arms so it's as though he's saying that person over there who you think at an easy glance is Adam look carefully uh, he's actually my friend uh, uh, John Gerard sorry I've given something away accidentally there because we don't know he's his friend but what what Mark Griffiths did was to ascertain that indeed he was, and that this was following a pattern, that this Dioscorides um, was also a contemporary. Um, and again, the way he did it was to look at what he's holding. So, yes, he's holding a book. He's obviously a, an author. He's a writer. Um, and he is also a namer of plants. And he named this plant Corona Imperialis, which means imperial crown. He was a servant, actually, of the Holy Roman Emperor, and he was indeed a friend of John Gerard and a great supporter of his in this book. He shared uh, great communication with him and sent him samples, etc., etc. And he was the great Flemish botanist Rembert de Doens. And if you pull up some pictures of de Doens, you see at a glance that it clearly is a, a very carefully done portrait of Dodoens. So we seem to have a pattern going here. We have a contemporary, has something to do with the book, the author, top left, uh, the great patron and supporter of the book, botanist Rembert Dodoens on the right. And in both cases, they are dressed as ancients. So what Mark Griffiths did was to continue researching this to see how the pattern unfolded and, of course, to look at Solomon, the wise, the just, the fair Solomon. Could this be a wise, just uh, contemporary who's dressed up as Solomon? Uh, again, the way uh, uh, the way Griffiths does this is to look what they're holding. In his right hand there, he's holding a bunch of Williams, big clue to his Christian name, no doubt. Uh, in his left hand, he's holding a bunch of lilies, if you look in Gerard's book at what he has to say about lilies, one sentence is very striking. No flower so lively sets forth the frailty of man's life as the lily. It is a symbol of mortality and frailty. Um, and 
so we're looking for a wise man who could have been involved with this book, who might have been rather frail, who might have been called William. Well, it's all getting actually very obvious, this, because the dedicatee of the book is William Sissel, Lord Burley, who was indeed described as wise and fair by his contemporaries and therefore likened to Solomon and had a huge knowledge, of course, of, of gardens and gardening and a huge love of it. And he is the dedicatee of this book, the great patron of the book. Uh, was he extremely frail? Indeed he was. Um, Gerard's dedication is signed and dated December 1597, only the previous month November 1597, we have a letter from André de Maïs, who's the French ambassador, talking of Burley, suffering from gout, and I quote, carried in a chair and is very old and white and deaf. Uh, and certainly if you read the biographies of Burley, he was acutely aware of his frailty uh, at this time when he was very close to death. So I think that is partly what that's about. But I also agree with an interpretation that Mark Griffiths put forward an alternative interpretation to this. He says, notice how a burly Solomon here is holding up those lilies to the royal coat of arms just above it, the coat of arms of Elizabeth. And of course, um, a nickname of Elizabeth, one nickname of Elizabeth is Lily. And in the Bible, we have this description of King Solomon uh, who even in his finest clothes is thought not to be as wondrous and as beautiful and as perfect as the lily. So in this sense, uh, Mark Griffiths is arguing that this symbol, he's holding up a lily and he's, he's proffering it up to Elizabeth as if to say, I am, I am of course, no, no greater, no higher, no, despite all my riches, I'm, no, uh, I'm some servant to you, essentially. Um, Mark Griffiths also noticed with very sharp eyes that uh, ear of wheat just behind the burly Solomon figure there and I think quite correctly um, drew attention to the wheat sheaf which is the crest i.e. the most important symbol really on the arms of Lord Burley. So I think the pattern is very clearly established now. We have three examples of a contemporary who is dressed as an ancient and has something to do with this book. A, a helper, a patron, the author himself. And Mark Griffiths understood perfectly well that what he needs to do is continue that pattern if we're going to understand who this figure of Apollo is. Uh, one thing that is, is immediately obvious is that this figure of Apollo is also a contemporary, and you can tell that because he's got a beard and moustache, and you don't get pictures of Apollo with a beard and moustache. So whoever this contemporary is, he's someone uh, with a beard and moustache. Um, I've put up here some pictures of Apollo uh, for no real reason but to um, show you his consistent use of the, the laurel wreath, or the laurels. Actually, if you look at the statue, you can see on the far left, you can see that that is dressed almost identically to the picture of Apollo um, on, on the Gerard title page. He's not actually wearing a wreath of laurels. He's got a, a crown that is symbolic of the sun, Phoebus Apollo. But if you look carefully down by his ankles, you'll see that the, the laurels are ever present. To find out more about that, you need to look at the myth of Daphne and Apollo, but I won't go into that now. Um, now, Mark Griffiths, uh, who I have nothing but praise for, but I think on, on this particular juncture, if, this, if he exactly followed the system I've been looking at it here, he failed to ask himself uh, the most important question at this point. And that important question should be, who of the contemporaries in 1597 who might be associated with John Gerard, who was most uh, likened by his contemporaries to Apollo? who would have the closest identification to Apollo. Now remember that Apollo was above all a patron, first and foremost, number one, he was a, he, he was a patron. Augustus, Augustine, St. Augustine says of Augustus, whom, I'm sorry, St. Augustine says of Apollo, he calls him he whom Athens calleth patron. And Robinson in 1583 writes of uh, noble writers affirm Apollo pattern chief and patron first to be. So it is absolutely crucial that whoever this person is, he's a patron. And like Apollo, he'll be a patron of writers, of composers, etc., etc., etc. So who was most likened um, to Apollo of contemporaries? And the answer is very simply, 
Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Um, all of these people I've listed here, uh, only one of them survives in, in manuscript, but all the rest in printed form, likened Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, to Apollo. So we have to admit uh, that the number one possibility for this Apollo, contemporary Apollo, has to be Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Of course, he was right in the right, correct circles, being the uh, son-in-law of the dedicatee of the book, Lord Burley, and therefore would have known John Gerard extremely well. Um, and of course, he was also um, a great patron of scholars, a great lover of gardens himself. So I think with little doubt, we would have to say Edward de Vere is the number one choice. But what about the physiognomy? Does this fellow actually look like Edward de Vere? We have a few difficulties here, and that's really to do with the fact of our rather scant pictorial uh, um, archive of pictures of Edward de Vere. The famous one, um, I don't think it looks hugely like him. It's not impossible, but if you look closely at the nose, again, noses do look different according to what angle you're doing it, but not quite the same nose. But again, it's very difficult to draw any firm conclusion from this particular picture. You notice the rough seems to be hiding the shape of his jawline, which is obviously key to an identification, and he doesn't have the huge beard and moustache, and we can't see whether he's got the curly hair because it's hidden in this in this picture. If you look at an earlier picture of Edward de Vere, um, you can just make out the curly hair behind his ear. Um, I think that the, 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 the jawline and the nose, the very straight nose, and the slightly high eyebrows do look like this picture. Um, I have to leave it to you, the viewer, to, to, to make your own judgment on this, and I can only give my personal view that I would not die of surprise if I were told, as a matter of fact, that these two people were a portrait of the same person. I think there's enough similarity to say it's a very strong possibility. What is remarkable, I think, is the similarity between the picture on the title page of the Botany book and this um, portrait by Hilliard. The portrait, um, you, we can argue about who, who sits in this portrait, because Hilliard doesn't tell us, but what we can't argue about is the type of person he was. He's a courtier, we can see that. We can see also that he is a poet. He's holding the hand of Apollo. Um, he has Argus eyes on his hat band, and of course feathers representing um, the winged Mercury. Remember that Oxford is described as winged like to Mercury. Um, by his contemporary, Gabriel Harvey. Um, a very good scholar who's called Gary Goldstein has written a whole piece on this, saying that this, arguing that this is indeed the Earl of Oxford, a portrait of the Earl of Oxford. I mean, who would be a great courtier poet in 1588 depicted by uh, Hilliard? Uh, can't be Philip Sidney, obviously he's dead by then. Uh, can't be Spencer because he's uh, in Ireland and Hilliard's in London. Um, it, it it really looks very firmly as that it is Oxford, and that curly hair also ties into a, a very early picture of Oxford in 1572 uh, at Windsor Castle. Sorry, I haven't got that here. What I have got here, which I think is really interesting, is this. What, you cry, I hear you all shout. Why are you showing me this? This is 1740. It's a statue, supposedly, of William Shakespeare, erected as a monument to him in, in Westminster Abbey. Now, those of you who have seen uh, my presentation, which is on this channel, called Where is Shakespeare Really Buried, will know that whoever made this monument deliberately placed it upon the very spot where Edward de Vere is buried. And I say knowingly, they knew that Edward de Vere was buried there. So it brings up the question, why does this statue look like this? And previously, we've had no answers. We've just been told that, oh, well, it's possibly an idealised idea of how William Shakespeare might have looked. Um, but now we know that this statue was placed on Edward de Vere's remains by people who knew Edward de Vere was buried there. We have to ask ourselves the question, did they know what Edward de Vere looked like? And did they make this a statue, uh, a portrait of Edward de Vere? All I can say at this stage is there is a clearly a remarkable similarity between this statue and the portrait of um, uh, Apollo, the patron Apollo, the contemporary, who seems to be Edward de Vere, uh, uh, on Gerard's book. Okay, um, one thing that is absolutely patently obvious is that this gormless Rotarian merchant who advertises himself in the Stratford-upon-Avon church looks absolutely nothing like 
uh, either the, the great court poet or any of the other portraits that we're lo looking at. Um, so I think poor old Mark Griffiths had a bit of a problem with that and to try and explain actually we've got to forget this this picture of Shakespeare up in the top right. We've got to think of him now looking like this. Um, uh, of course the difficulty was in Stratford-upon-Avon. Enough people knew William of Stratford and they would have remonstrated had the bus not looked remotely like William of Stratford. So I think we can say that the Stratford bust is a reasonable representation of William of Stratford. You can quite clearly see that he uh, doesn't look anything like this great Apollo figure um, being depicted as a patron on this um, title page. Okay, now uh, let us not forget the great trick that, um, that Mark Griffiths played, and that was to identify the contemporary by looking at what they're holding. So let's just have a look carefully at this Apollo Oxford figure and see what he's holding. In his left hand he's holding uh, a cob of maize or what sweet corn sometimes called. Uh, wasn't actually called sweet corn in those days. If you look at Gerard's book he has a whole chapter on it, chapter 61, and it's entitled Of Turkey Corn. Actually, Gerard knew perfectly well, didn't necessarily come from Turkey, but he conceded that it was called Turkey Corn. Um, in his right hand, he's holding a very distinctive flower, which even in black and white is impossible to muddle with any other flower, so distinctive it is. Uh, those wonderful checks. Um, we know it actually as the snake's head fritillary. Very, very beautiful purple and white checked flower. Very rare in England, but it does grow in great profusion in Oxford, particularly in the Magdalen Meadows. And obviously the question arises whether Gerard has uh, got this plant, this, this wonderful flower put into the hands of this Apollo to signify that he is Oxford, the connection to Oxford. If you go online and look up Snake's Head Fertility, you'll find that it is... Uh, known and vaunted as the iconic flower of Oxford. But nobody is really sure whether uh, this goes right back to ancient times or whether this flower was imported in the 1590s, how it got to Oxford and what stage it became identified with Oxford. So it is possible that there, there is a deliberate Oxford connection here and it's possible also that it's a, a weird fluke. Um, Either way, again, uh, Gerard has a whole chapter on this flower, chapter 89, and here he calls it the turkey hen or guinea hen flower. These are two names for uh, what we now call the guinea fowl, uh, the turkey hen. And you'll notice also there that he's calling it by the Latin name fritillaria and also checkered daffodil. So turkey hen flower, turkey corn, what have these got to do with the Earl of Oxford? Um, now, to answer this question, I'm going to have to take you back to have another look at the whole page. Now, you'll remember that I mentioned the importance of the direction that uh, John Gerard as Adam was facing, but, and also the direction in which um, Remember de Doens, whose clothes as Dioscorides, it's important where they're looking. These are the sort of tiny details that the Tudors love to be involved with. Can you see anything odd about Oxford in the way he's comporting himself? Um, I think you can. I think it's pretty obvious that something very, very odd is going on with Oxford. And he's facing, essentially, he's facing the wrong way. If I flip the image like that, you see at once that that looks how exactly how the title page should look. Um, you've got all four of them essentially looking into the middle in, in praise of the title of the book. Um, you've got uh, Gerard as Adam and Rembert Dodones who are holding up flowers close to their face, but they're holding them out in the margins so that they're all essentially looking inwards and looking towards each other. And this is how the, the figure of Oxford as Apollo should look. Quite obviously, it's, it's symmetrical and sensible. So we have to ask ourselves a question. Why is he like that? This is not a question that uh, Mark Griffiths asked himself. Mark Griffiths, for all his brilliance and wondrousness, he's not a great student of Shakespeare. I think he may be becoming one now he's made this discovery. Um, but so he is a Stratfordianist, and it hasn't occurred to him that something very interesting is going on here. 
uh, Oxford, you can see, uh, dressed as Apollo, is looking away. And not only is he looking away, is he's holding up that huge flower so that it is masking his face, so that the other characters, his father-in-law there and John Gerard and uh, Dodoans, they can't see his face. It is hidden. Now, it is very obvious why it's hidden to an Oxfordian, because Oxfordians all know perfectly well that the Earl of Oxford was what is known as a concealed poet. That is to say, he hid his name. He was also a concealed patron. It's not often discussed this, but it's a very important point. We, we hear Thomas Coriat, who writes about Oxford, saying that he doesn't like to be praised in poetry. He's very self-effacing. Um, Nash dedicates a whole book to Oxford, but instead of dedicating it to Oxford, he, de he gives the dedicatee, he gives him a pseudonym. Have you ever heard such a thing? So even the patron is pseudonymized. Um, we also find, of course, references by John Dee uh, to Oxford as someone who greatly helped him. But where do you see any book by John Dee that's actually dedicated to Oxford? So there's quite a lot of evidence that he is a concealed patron, um, but he is also, of course, a concealed poet. And the contemporaries would have all known that. Certainly any contemporary who read uh, Bodenham's book called Belvedere, which was published in 1600, would have read uh, Bodenham talking about Oxford's works that are extant, which means published or publi pu publicly to be seen, extant among other honourable personages' writings. In other words, Bodenham is telling us that Oxford's works are published under other people's names. Well, we um, know that one of those names is William Shakespeare, but there were others. But the key point I'm trying to make here is that is that Oxford is a concealed poet, and that is what is being shown, concealed patron, concealed poet. So if we're trying to find out the relevance of these plants he's holding, are we looking in the right direction? Do we actually need to look a little bit at the whole history of coyness, of naming poets and saying who they are? Um, in their lifetimes, in, the, in that age, you'll find a lot of examples of, of people coyly not naming poets. Instead of saying Philip Sidney outright, you'll get a lot of his contemporaries calling him Astrophel, called Astrophel, of course, after the Astrophel and Stella sonnets that he wrote. So he's been called after a character in one of his works, just as Thomas Nash is known as Pierce, after Pierce Penniless that he wrote. Um, Samuel Daniel is Rosamond, after the complaint of Rosamond. Uh, Christopher Marlowe is called by his contemporaries Leander, after Hero and Leander. Edmund Spencer, Colin, Colin Cloud, of course. Thomas Watson, Amintus, Michael Drayton, uh, Roland. Henry Rosalie, I've done an upload about this. Uh, Diella, the author of the Diella sonnets. And William Shakespeare, Adon, or Adon. Now, he's called Adon because Adon, of course, uh, means Lord. Um, but the other reason is, of course, it is a known and regular contraction of Adonis, and Shakespeare was the author of uh, Venus and Adonis, the poem that made him made that name so famous. Um, here is the end of a poem about Narcissus, um, published in 1595 by someone called Thomas Edwards. And you can see he's discussing poets and he talks of Diella, the, the author of the Diella sonnets, Rosalie, we know that. Uh, Rosamond, we know that's an allusion to um, uh, Samuel Daniel. So we've gone through these Amintus, that's Thomas Watson. Leander, that's um, uh, Christopher Marlowe. And then he gets on to talk about Adon, Lord, yes, but Adonis. It's short for Adonis. And I have yet to come across a single scholar on any side of the authorship debate who disagrees that this is a reference to William Shakespeare, the author of Venus and Adonis, here described as Adon, but of course deftly masking through a great trouble for Stratfordians, that deftly masking, not seen and not heard. In other words, he's a concealed poet uh, behind a pseudonym. That's how he's masking. I think I've already shown you the joke about uh, uh, deaf ear which is, of course, a joke on, on De Vere. So when we're seeing deftly masking through again, it's a bit of a clue to De Vere, um, who wrote Venus and Adonis and, and described as in purple robes, only, only, only nobility were allowed to wear purple robes, disdained, he's in disgrace in some sort of way.
amidst the centre of this climb, I have heard say doth remain, as I have heard say, you know, gossip tells me, uh, you know, all sub subfusk under the cloak, I've heard that he's right in the centre of all these poets, this disgraced nobleman who's deftly masking through. Okay, I, I went into this because clearly um, we're going to ask ourselves, is it possible that the, the contemporary who is represented here is Adon, Lord, uh, the author of Venus and Adonis? Um, now, if, he's, if he is Adon, if he is Adonis, then yes, turkey corn makes a lot of sense. Uh, Adonis was the uh, king of Cyprus, and to anyone in 1597 reading this book, they would have known perfectly well that Cyprus was one of the Turkish dominions, and Adonis would have been described, in fact, as a Turk. Funnily enough, there's another little coincidence, and I don't know if that's relevant, but Queen Elizabeth is said to have called the Earl of Oxford my Turk. Turning Turk is, is uh, an expression meaning either falling away from your religion or, or just going a bit on the wild side, which certainly Oxford did. But we're sticking here to uh, Adonis, and yes, uh, Adonis would be described as, as uh, Turkish uh, by contemporaries then, and corn, yes, of course, Adonia, the great festival of the corn. Uh, Adonis was considered almost like the god of corn in the Adonia festival, always in his honour every year to, to hope to get ripe and good corn. So that's why he's holding that. The turkey hen flower at the top, again turkey, that's a, that's a connection to Adonis, and most specifically it is a connection to the poem Venus and Adonis. Uh, and it's a very, very important climactical point the, the chief symbol of that whole long poem culminates uh, with a description of this very flower. Those of you who have read Venus and Adonis will know what happens, that the young Adonis gets bored in the, uh, sorry, gets um, stabbed, skewered in the groin by a wild boar and dies of it. And at the end of the poem, we have by this the boy that by her side lay killed was melted like a vapour from her sight. And in his blood that on the ground lay spilled, a purple flower sprung up checked with white. Now this can only be, and I, have, I haven't heard a botanist argue it, it can only be the uh, turkey hen flower, the snake's head fritillary, famous flower of Oxford. Um, I am going to tell you in, in a future upload, which I'm going to call Adon's Flower, and I'm going to show you exactly why Shakespeare broke away from his source, that's Ovid, who describes um, Adonis metamorphosing into an anemone. Why did Shakespeare break away from that and put this particular um, purple flower checkered with white. Why did he do it? There's a wonderfully clever reason why he did it. And I will I will do that in my next upload called Adon's Flower. Please watch out for it. But for the time now, um, I think what we're showing here very clearly is that, I hope clearly, <clears throat> uh, that this character here is um, uh, uh, Adon. He's the hidden poet. So he's, we, we've followed this the system all the way through from number one. We had John Gerard dressed up as Adam, Rembert de Dones dressed as Dioscorides, uh, number three was William Cecil dressed as Lord, uh, sorry, dressed, dressed as Solomon, excuse me, and finally the concealed poet Adon, who we know is the great patron Oxford, uh, dressed as Apollo, who's associated with Apollo. So this way we know that John Gerard, who knew Oxford presumably very well indeed, was, along with all those other people I've been presenting on, totally aware that the Earl of Oxford was Adon, was the author of Venus and Adonis, which appeared for the first time in 1593 under the name of William Shakespeare. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope you'll appreciate that I am bowing uh, hugely to uh, the, the discoverer of this, to Mark Griffiths, um, he, he was at a great disadvantage uh, being a Stratfordianist, but he got there. He somehow groped his way to the finishing line and got it right. I think now we see this through the Oxfordian lens. The whole thing is a great deal clearer than he was able to present it. But I doff my cap to him, and I think we can all be grateful for another wonderful piece of evidence supporting 
the Oxfordian thesis. Please subscribe if you like these things. It's a great help to me and press the little bell button. And uh, thank you for listening.